Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's Free CompTIA A Plus Certification Training Course on Security Fundamentals. I'm James Messer, and in this module, we're going to discuss the requirements from CompTIA's Exam 220-601, Section 6.1, where we need to identify the fundamental principles of security. We're going to go through quite a bit of high-level topics, and in future videos, we'll drill down on pieces of these to give you more details as they relate to the CompTIA A Plus certification. Today, we're going to talk about authentication technologies, file system security, protection from malicious software, software firewalls, and finally, we'll end up the conversation with social engineering. Let's start our conversation with authentication technologies. If you've ever logged into a computer before, logged into a network, you know that you've been authenticated generally with a username and a password, something we do on websites every day. Now, this is something that we know. It's information that's in our head. And you very often hear, don't share your password with anyone, because then they'll have access to the same machines that you have access to. There's also authentication technologies that talk about something you have. Things like biometrics and scanners are a very good example of this. There are also things like smart cards and finally key fobs or token generators. So let's talk about some of these things and how they apply to what we're doing with security. When we talk about things that we know, we're really talking about things like usernames. Now, in some cases, the username that you're using can be relatively obvious. It may be your first initial and last name. It may be your first name and your last initial. It may be your entire name that you're using as your username. Now, this is not always the case. In some environments where security is really important, they get rid of names completely. You may have a name that is U745688. That may be your username. This is a little bit more challenging for a network administrator who has to figure out who that is. There's other ways to go about doing that. But it does help you create a more secure environment because when you see a username, you don't immediately know who that is. And if somebody knows your name, they don't automatically know your username. So it works in both directions. Passwords are something that is usually much more private than the username is. In fact, they're usually under very rigorous control. And most people think about the password strength as being something related to the length the complexity, and also the age of the password, how often you have to change this password. Passwords, you, you may not be aware of this, but passwords generally are not stored anywhere. The actual password you have is not a place where somebody with the proper access could go in and look at a copy of your password. What usually happens is the login program hashes your password. It creates a cryptographic one-way hash of your password that's represented in a way like this. For instance, the word Professor Messer, all one word, is hashed with this this SHA-256 hashing algorithm as this big, long string of characters. So what happens is that when I'm ready to log in next time, I log in and put in my Professor Messer name. It is hashed again in my login program, and it's compared to this long string, which is also stored out on the authentication server. And so if those two match, it knows that I used the correct password. See how sneaky that is? They don't actually keep my real password there. That's why if you ever have to reset your password, they always name your password to something else or they clear it out. They can't go back and put your password in because they don't know what your password is. It's already been cryptographically hashed so that nobody can see your password. Another piece to authentication security, and one that's becoming a lot more popular not only in large organizations, but also in places, for instance, across the internet, is something that you have. This is called two-factor or multi-factor authentication. This means that not only do you know your username and password, you also have some physical piece of something with you. Those physical pieces of some things could be things like biometrics. Your fingerprint, for instance, makes a very good authentication method because hopefully you're the only one walking around with your fingerprints. So sometimes, especially on newer laptops, you'll see fingerprint scanners on there. In larger organizations, you'll see smart cards. These are cards that have embedded within them small little pieces of memory that contain information about you or something that's linked to you in some way. And finally, there are things like key fobs or security token generators. You may see people with these on their key rings, for instance, or on a lanyard. And that is a device that creates a pseudo random number. When you hit a button on it, it gives you a number. And when you log in with your name and your password, you also have to put this number in. And the number's changing every 30 seconds, every 60 seconds or 
or so. And it's synced up with the same algorithm back at the home office. So when you put in your number, it has to match or at least be close to the, the previous or last update of what's at the home office. And that way, you know the person logging in has logged in with their username, with their password, and they must have this key fob with them because nobody else has the same key fob with the same token generation capabilities. Every token generator has got a different number on it. It's got a different setup. So it's, it's something that only you have. And if you're logging in and authenticating and the number is correct, it must be you or you must be the one who has that token generator with them. That's something you don't want to lose. You lose your token generator. You also are no longer able to log into the network. Now that you've authenticated into the network, or you've used your username, your password, you maybe biometrics, or you've put your token in from your token generator, now you're in the file system. So there needs to be some type of security in the file system itself to provide some extra sets of security. And one of the ways is the file system itself in the operating system has built into it security functionality. It, it has to. NTFS is a file system from the very beginning. It was designed with security in mind. And so there is extensive security-based permissions embedded within the file system itself. So much so that if you boot from a separate CD to get into the recovery console, the only way you can get to the files that are on the drive is if you have an administrator password. So there's capabilities not only for the user and the username going in, but also groups that this is based around. Grouping of security, very common in file systems, allows you to group different people together and assign rights on those groups. This makes it very easy to administer. Otherwise, you'd be going to every single user to decide what they're doing. It's much easier to say, if you're in the HR department, here are the rights and permissions you have across the directories and files. And the types of rights and permissions in NTFS are extensive. This is an example of some of those. And you can see you're able to set rights, permissions on a lot of different settings. This allows someone who's administering an NTFS server to be able to create just the right security profile based on who's logging in. And that means you can have a very diverse set of people logging into a single server. An ongoing concern at most organizations today is being able to protect individual systems from malicious software that's out there. The challenge today is that the bad guys are trying to get to everybody's workstation now and be able to take over that workstation or have it lie dormant until such a time the bad guy would like to do something. Send emails, take over another website, bounce through your machine on its way to somewhere else. The idea is that these viruses and trojans and worms will take over a machine. And to be able to protect your machine, usually you have antivirus software loaded on them. I do hear from time to time that the group of people say, don't worry about antivirus software. Just don't run anything bad on your system and you'll be fine. The problem, of course, is that you never know exactly what might be good and what might be bad until you run it. And the nice part about antivirus software is it has what they call a sandbox setup that runs these malicious programs, or runs every program prior to your system running it to see if it does anything unusual. And if it checks out OK, it sends it on its way. Antivirus isn't the only thing you need to have loaded. There's also a challenge in many organizations to keep those bad emails and those bad things from coming into the, the organization to begin with. And so there is a constant deluge of spam of these emails constantly being sent in that have all kinds of different viruses connected to them, links out to other sites that can then infect you. So it's best if you can stop the spam before it hits the major part of the organization. There's also a need today to stop the spyware and adware and what they call grayware. These are, are also protected through anti-spyware pieces of software. And you're noticing now that operating systems are shipping not only with antivirus software installed on them, but also anti-spyware software installed on them as well. And finally, one of the biggest problems we see is identity theft. Ultimately, your money is in your account and the bad guys want your money. They're going to try to get you to log into a fake website with your real username and your real password. And then they're going to go to the real site, log in as your name, and start doing things to your account and your, and your identity that you weren't even expecting. You thought you were logging into the appropriate site, but you really weren't. Now you're starting to see why those key fobs and those key uh, random key numbers are so important. Even if they get your username and password, they don't have something you have. They don't have the random number. And so they're not able to get into your account if that's the type of account that you're using. Unfortunately, such a small percentage of sites is 
taking advantage of some of those pseudo random key fob technologies that unfortunately there's still a lot of opportunity out there for people trying to steal people's identity. Unfortunately, there's such a small percentage of organizations that have implemented these pseudo random number key generators that the identity thieves, they still have plenty of room to work with to steal people's identity and be able to take advantage of these vulnerabilities. We spoke in earlier videos about the need for software-based firewalls. You sometimes will hear these referred to as personal firewalls. They're certainly more than personal these days. They're really embedded into the operating system, and they're there to protect individual devices. These are really useful if you are on a laptop and you're very mobile, and maybe it's not even the one built into your operating system. Many uh, third-party solutions when you purchase antivirus and you purchase spyware may also come with a third-party firewall that's included with that. This is The idea behind this is that it is a stateful firewall. It prevents someone from coming into your device without you inviting them. What it does is block traffic by application. So everything by default is blocked. Nobody can hit your machine unless you have specifically allowed them access or if your application has already talked out to the internet, it opens up a small hole just for that application and just over that particular set of ports that that application is using at the moment. And when that application is done, the firewall closes the hole again. And that's what it means by stateful. While you're using that application, the state of the firewall remains open. And when the application closes down, the state of the firewall changes based on what you're doing on the firewall. Very nice capability. Again, really helpful for laptops or people who are mobile that need to be on wireless networks in public places but still need to be protected. Up to this point, the security concerns that we've talked about, you've been able to manage through technology. You've been able to put firewalls in place. You've been able to buy antivirus. But there are security concerns that really don't apply to technology. One of those is social engineering. Social engineering is someone who is trying to use you as a person to gather information or even provide access. And this, this is a major threat, especially since you can't detect it through electronics. You can't see somebody providing social engineering through a firewall. You can't stop this with anti-spyware. And unfortunately, if somebody's really good at social engineering, they can really gather a lot of information, whether it's something where you're talking to people or maybe you're going and dumpster diving and grabbing information from there. You're still finding ways to get information without going through the normal security that's on the network. We see this often when you get a phone call. It's very suspicious. Hi, this is Bob from the help desk. We're noticing something odd happening with your laptop computer that you're using there. We'd like to check that out. I'm going to load up some software. Hand me, uh, if you could provide me with your username and password, I'll get this process started for you. That's a very common type of social engineering, one you have to have to watch out for. You also have to look for people who may be unattended in your environments, especially at work. Maybe they don't have a badge. Maybe they didn't follow certain processes. So also keep an eye on those types of things. There's a very good example of real world social engineering that's done every year at a trade show called Info Security Europe. And what they do is they show up at a train station, and this is done in London, I think is where this show is, and they ask people for their password and their date of birth and some other personal information that people really shouldn't be given out. The real trick is here, they say, we'll give you some chocolate if you give us your password. And so very often, uh, in fact, this past year, they asked 576 people coming off the train, can I get your password? 61% of them provided their date of birth, and 21% of them provided their password, all for some chocolate. It's interesting that about half of the people they asked knew the passwords of the people they worked with. And more than a third said they could get their CEO's password if they really wanted to. Now, that type of social engineering is done out in the open. It's very obvious, and it's interesting that they report on this. If somebody was really crafty, they could probably even get that percentage really even a little bit higher. And this is exactly the way that people are giving up information and opening the network to security problems. The only way to protect against social engineering is with people. You do need to understand the processes involved. I'm sure your organization that you work for probably has a security policy that says, here's what we do if we think there's a social engineering problem or if somebody's provided more information than we thought they should. 
There is usually in the security policies a plan for something like that. At the very minimum, ask some questions. If you see somebody who doesn't have a badge on, ask them, hey, where's your badge? If somebody's walking around you don't recognize, introduce yourself. At the very minimum, make a phone call. Call the help desk and say, was somebody supposed to come look at that server? Because we have somebody here who's doing that. We don't know that person. Those are very simple things to do that can stop problems before they come become major security problems. And given the environments these days with identity theft, very simple thing to do to resolve these issues. In review, we've looked at a lot of different security overviews here. We've looked at authentication technologies, something you know and something you have. We've looked at file system security, how protection from malicious software and the different types of protections that are available with antivirus, anti-spyware, and software-based firewalls. And finally, we ended the conversation discussing social engineering and some of the things you might expect to see with social engineering in our environments today. For more free a videos, to participate in our message boards, and much more, you can visit our website, freeaplus.com. <laughs>